um, mentioning my, my career, Catherine, I, I have a disreputable nephew who once referred to my uncle the spy because I'd always been in places where things seemed to be happening. But um, uh, I nearly sued him for it. And my answer to that was, the spies are the ones who don't actually write anything very much, but I have to appear in print. Anyway, I, when I prepare a, a talk like this, I always probably spend an entire night putting my thoughts in order and as a, uh, you put too many thoughts down. So I'm going to have to try and keep this a little bit tighter than I, than I thought and we can come to things perhaps in question and answer that uh, I, I might have s skimmed over. Um, nonetheless, I wanted to start with the election and I wanted to start with what to me was uh, if you like, the most sort of gobsmacking moment about the election. And it was uh, late on one Monday evening when I left my office, which is just on the banks of the Spree, looking across at the Bundestag, uh, and came out the door, and I looked across down the river towards the Hauptbahnhof, and there was this amazing poster that had just gone up, 80 metres long by 20 metres high, and all it showed were Merkel's hands made up of all these tiny little pictures of other people's hands. Merkel's hands in this absolutely classic position, thumb, thumbs and fingers together in a sort of little diamond. <clears throat> the ultimate image of reassurance, but also brilliant advertising, totally recognisable. You didn't hesitate for a moment. You knew they were Merkel's hands. And this one little thing in the corner just said CDU. Nothing else. Round the corner there was another um, poster that said... Germany's future in safe hands. And it just was absolutely what the election became all about. It was a very calculated risk by the planners of the Christian Democratic Union to fight on her personality and not on policies. Because German elections are not fought on personality. They are fought on policies. It's not a personality-driven culture. And it worked, almost, because there's no doubt that the huge popularity of Angela Merkel was what carried her party to uh, almost an absolute majority. She's far more popular than Helmut Kohl ever was. His popularity was always about 16 or 18 percent. He wasn't a popular chancellor. He had a very powerful party. She is a very popular chancellor, and her party is actually not that well organized at the moment. But she ended up still five seats short of a majority, of an absolute majority. And that means she needs a coalition partner. <laughs> so you have a peculiar outcome. The actual voters voted by a narrow majority for the right. But the majority in the Bundestag is by a narrow margin to the left. And that's, of course, because of the failure of the Liberal Free Democrats and also the Eurosceptic Alternative for Deutschland to make the 5% mark. So all their votes would have been essentially more right than left, and that would have put the balance of power on the right. But what we're going to get out of these coalition negotiations is actually a grand coalition that is probably pretty close to the centre, but nonetheless more to the left than the victorious party in the elections. Um, just quickly to exclude the two other possibilities. Why, with only five sheets short of an absolute majority, did Angela Merkel not try to govern with a minority parliament instead of having these interminable coalition negotiations uh, before she can form a government? She is absolutely adamant that she needs a stable government. And she needs a stable government for one reason above all others, and that's the Eurozone crisis. She's still worried enough about where Europe is going that to have had a government that was always having to beg, borrow, or steal votes from the opposition would simply not work. And the second potential outcome, which I think still has to be clearly excluded, is that that centre-left left majority in the Bundestag of the SPD, the Greens, and the far-left Linker Party uh, is not going to happen. And it's not going to happen because the SPD is simply not prepared to try and forge a government with the Linker because they mistrust them on Europe 
and they mistrust them on NATO. They say the left is not reliable on either of those things. We cannot be a responsible international government if we have the left as our partners in power. And I think that is that goes quite deep. There are many other issues. We were talking about them just beforehand at lunch, uh, about why the SPD mistrusts the linker. Partly there's a lot of bad blood personally with the far left in the west of Germany. Uh, and... But nonetheless, at the end of the day, they wouldn't have been fair partners. So what do we have? Only two options. A grand coalition again. Merkel rather enjoyed it last time. She was between 2005 and 2009. A grand coalition. Or a black-green coalition. Lots of people want a CDU-green coalition to happen in Germany. A, A significant minority in both parties journalists want it to happen because it would be fun this has never happened before Uh, and political scientists want it to happen for very much the same sort of reason the untried experiment but I don't think it will happen until it's happened in one of the big Bundesländer and then when they've shown that it can work in a land like North Rhine-Westphalia or Baden-Württemberg or Saxony, where a good friend of mine is plotting actively to have that as the outcome from the next election, it's not going to happen in Berlin. But you cannot totally exclude it. If, and what I'm coming to, these great negotiations for a grand coalition with the SPD fail for one reason or another, and the only really likely reason they will fail, I think, is not the content It's the referendum that has got to happen in the SPD after the negotiations have been concluded to see whether the grassroots will vote for it, and that is a risk. If that went wrong, then Merkel still has a fallback position of a possible coalition with the Greens. Um, As I said, I think a grand coalition is her first choice. She actually liked it last time, and she's on the left of her party. She is clearly very pragmatic, very middle of the ground, and as we saw throughout the election campaign and beforehand, she's brilliant at stealing the ideas of the opposition when they look like being popular. Minimum wage, I'll have a bit of that. Rent controls, yeah, we can do that. Topping up pensions, we're fine on that too. And to the discomfort and horror of many of her more conservative supporters, she kept grabbing social democrat policies until she had this clearly occupying right across the middle ground of German politics. Now, the Grand Coalition talks have, as you will have been watching, and so have I, although I've taken my eye off it for the last few days, um, been dragging on for quite a long time. There are no huge issues that have blown up of great difficulty between them. Um, But nonetheless, they're not meant to look easy. Now, particularly, that's particularly important for the Social Democrats. They're going to have to turn around and go back to their grassroots members and say, we got what we needed, we got a few really good Social Democrat policies onto the agenda. So they've got to show that it's they fought for their core policies to persuade their own party faithful. But at the end of the day, a grand coalition in Germany is going to be what? Firmly pro-European. If anything in recent times, the Social Democrats have been more pro-European than the Christian Democrats and certainly than the Free Democrats ever were. They're going to be very clearly dedicated towards this Schuldenbremse, the debt break, the balanced budget that they've written into the Constitution and forced everybody else to do in the Eurozone. So a balanced budget is a fundamental part of that. They're going to be socially sympathetic. There's a big social wing in the CDU and in the CSU. Um, But none of it is going to be very dramatically different to the middle-of-the-road German government policy that we've really had for the last eight years. It's going to be a Merkel government with a few social democratic knobs on it. Now, if the social democrats do vote for it in their party referendum and they've got a deal, they vote in December, which is what Sigmar Gabriel, their leader, wants, uh, he wants to be able to have time to buy presents for Christmas, he says. We all need that, so we're going to have a government by Christmas. Now, I'll come back to that. I wanted to just touch, and this is where I'm going to have to cut back a bit, I think, but touch a little bit about the colour and fun of the campaign because uh, it tells us quite a lot about the German political process that's behind these negotiations. Um, 
One of the very difficult things for a journalist covering this campaign was that there was enormous international interest in what was happening, but it was actually a desperately dull and predictable campaign. The opinion polls were absolutely flatlining for Merkel up here, for the SPD, a good 13, 14, 15 points behind. And the only shifts and the only interest was really what was happening down the bottom. Would the Liberals, the Free Democrats get the 5% and therefore give Merkel a centre-right majority, or would they fall below it and force her probably to do exactly what's happened, a grand coalition? And the other key question, an interesting one, was what was going to happen to the Eurosceptics, this Alternative für Deutschland, and I'll come back to that. But the CDU plan was very clear. One of my friends described it to me rather nicely as they wanted a Teletubbies campaign. They wanted it short, sweet, and soporific. And then Merkel's personality would decide the outcome. And it's basically what they got. The hands summed it all up. You got the woman you knew. There was no mood for change in Germany. They were entirely happy with the way that Chancellor Merkel has been in charge. She's reassuring, she's calm, she's measured, she's utterly sensible, she has no great visions, she's very steady. She's absolutely infuriating to her opponents and to excitable hacks because she makes the same bloody speech all the time, same figures, same lessons, same message. But of course, her audience is always different, but we, the journalists, are always going to the same speech endlessly. We couldn't find a new story in it. German elections are not supposed to be exciting. It's all rather well choreographed. Every party draws up a big manifesto, which they know they're going to have to tear up when they go into the coalition negotiations and actually decide what they can agree on. Everybody commits themselves to rather nice generalities, better schools, housing, a fair society, care for the elderly, all the obvious things, one or two catchy headlines. What was very noticeable in the campaign was the CDU's manifesto was almost totally bland. About the only clear thing in it was no tax rises. Whereas the SPD and the Greens actually stuck their necks out, went for tax rises on higher income earners, and I think it blew up in their faces like other things did. The fascinating thing was, why would an opposition party go into a German election campaign preaching tax rises? I mean, surely this is poison. And the reason in Germany is, no, a balanced budget is more important than actually whether tax rises are going to go up. Everybody went into this campaign saying, we're not going to blow the budget. And it's one fundamental lesson I think you've got to come away from this with. They're not going to blow the balanced budget. Um, so uh, I, I think I, I better uh, shoot on because I need to come to the coalition negotiations. But just, just over the course of the campaign, of course, um, the SPD just never got it right. I mean, with Per Steinbrück, they had a, a very interesting, highly intelligent candidate. But uh, somebody said before the elections, OK, you've got two very intelligent candidates for chancellor and only one of them is nice. Who are you going to vote for? He never managed to be nice. He's got a rather abrasive line. He made some very foolish mistakes early on. He, he said that uh, he thought the Chancellor was actually paid uh, too little. Uh, he said, rather a nice one for an Irish audience, he said, I would never pay, uh, I would never buy a bottle of Pinot Grigio for less than five euros. When did you last see a bottle of Pinot Grigio for five euros? <laughs> The average price of a bottle of wine in Germany, I believe, is two ninety nine. Um, so it didn't go down very well. Anyway, um, uh, very frustrating campaign for the SPD. They just never could get out of the 25 26% level. And there was Merkel up on 39 40 41 um, the Greens had an extraordinary meltdown. We all expected the Greens to end up with about 15%. They'd had this surge in support over the Fukushima nuclear disaster. And then suddenly at the end of the campaign, they just plummeted. Why? One, I think, the tax question. They looked like they were going to tax people who actually among their own supporters. Um, and there's another thing about taxes that I learned many years ago in politics. If you say you're going to tax only the well-to-do, the worrying thing is that people hope that even if they're not well-to-do, their children may be well-to-do, so it won't help them very much. 
Um, Secondly, I think they were too social democratic. By allying themselves totally with the SPD and running on a rather social democratic platform, they ignored the real reason people vote for them, which is the environment, all about the environment. And finally, uh, they, they had, well, two things went wrong. They, they, somebody came out with this idea that public canteens should all have one vegetables-only day every week, and that was brilliantly turned around, including by Merkel. We don't pe- tell people when they can eat their Wurst. Uh, <laughs> And she just made the Greens appear to be the regulators, the interferers, the, the nannies. Uh, and, and that paid against them. And then there was a paedophile scandal, a very old paedophile scandal that came out at the very end of the campaign, which said that actually the Greens way back in the early 80s had been in favour or defended paedophiles. And, that, and their vote literally crumbled in those last days. And finally, the, the Liberals fought this dreadful campaign where the leadership was all over the place, they had no policies, they were completely unclear where they were going. All they were doing was begging that the second vote, the vote for party as opposed to person, please, Christian Democrats, give your second vote to us. And when Merkel said no, I think it was curtains for them. I'm going to come back to the Alternative für Deutschland because I think at the end of the day that's one of the open questions that's still out there. This little Eurosceptic party. Now I was absolutely clear I'd covered two other German elections before. I'd covered the early 90s when there was an anti Euro pro Deutschmark party and so on and nobody had ever got a breakthrough on that sort of platform and suddenly they were pretty close and they're going to get into the European Parliament because there the, the, the threshold is only 3% so it's going to be very different, different very interesting to see uh, whether they've got any longer term traction but I'm going to come back to them anyway, um, it's Merkel who won it uh, although somewhat by default, because the others all actually had rather useless campaigns. And I just, it's, what is it about Merkel's message that works in Germany? It's a very clever, ambiguous message. I am pro-European. That is absolutely essential for any lead German politician. But I'm defending the national interest and protecting the German taxpayer absolutely in tune with the thinking in Germany today. And it's this ambiguity that we all find perhaps so difficult in interpreting quite where German policy and the balance of German policy is on Europe. Um, I won't waste the taxpayers' cash. I'm the Swabian housewife. And the other thing about Merkel that you should never forget is that she has a wonderful sense of humour. At these all these very staged rallies that you have in German election campaigns... They, they usually start off with some local TV personality who interviews the big speaker in toe-curlingly cringing form about why you're so very wonderful and tell us about your favourite pet or whatever. And I remember it was in Dusseldorf and Merkel arrives and she'd done about three meetings already that day. She did a huge number of meetings to, to back up the hands. And she arrives and this moderator says, Oh, Frau Merkel... You've been working so hard and yet you always look so cool. How do you do it? And she looked very straight at this woman. She said, you know, I have been making a significant contribution to the German makeup industry. Uh, she, She just has that. Anyway, where are we going? Merkel has laid out four big challenges for the next government. And I think this sums up both the way she's handling the negotiations and the way she sees things. One two and three probably, but one, stabilising the euro, stabilising the eurozone. It is absolutely the top priority. Two, cutting the cost of the energy transition, the energy transformation they're going through in Germany, making it manageable and making sure that it doesn't ruin German competitiveness, the thing they're so proud of, because the switch out of nuclear and to renewables is looking at this moment very expensive. German energy costs today are already 60% above US energy costs. They've got to do something which is not going to be going back to nuclear energy. It's going to be a very difficult challenge, and it's a core one in these negotiations. The third thing, interestingly, she throws into the mix is federal reform. Why federal reform? Well, it's actually all about helping the lender to also balance their budgets, which they've got to do by 2020. And guess who rules most of the lender? The SPD. 
So this is Merkel's way of actually bringing those SPD state premiers into the whole framework of a grand coalition. And finally, Merkel's constant long-term theme, managing the demographic challenge, managing the aging population, maintaining German competitiveness with an increasingly old population. And that, of course, is a very nice umbrella, if you like, for some more socially-oriented policies and ones that might appeal to the SPD, doing more to enable women to work, balance career and home, doing more for old age pensioners and old age care, and so on, doing, being actually a little more liberal, a little more open perhaps on the immigration front. An interesting one, it's proving to be quite a difficult issue within the negotiations, whether they will actually expand and extend the double citizenship which at the moment, if you're a Turkish immigrant in Germany, you've got to decide by the age of 21 whether you're Turkish or German. Nobody else has to decide that, but Turks do. And the SPD is pushing very hard, because it's now a significant voting part, part of the voting population, the Turkish community, uh, that they should have a right to a double citizenship for most of their time. Now, what's going to emerge with the SPD? Well, on Europe, it's the thing that I think probably concerns you most, concerns me most, not too much detail if they can get away with it. They don't want to put it all down in the coalition negotiations. It's all very well being able to go to Brussels and saying we can't do that, it was in the coalition negotiations. But actually, she knows, Sigmar Gabriel knows, Wolfgang Schäuble knows, that you've got to negotiate in Brussels so you don't want to tie yourself down to an utterly predictable position. So what's going to happen on banking union? They've got to have a deal. They're aiming to have a deal in December on banking union. Well, on banking union, the SPD is probably even more hard line than the CDU is. Um, for example, absolutely no taxpayers' money should go into bailing out banks. There shall be no direct recapitalization from the European Stability Mechanism. That has been a fundamental SPD position for months. And it's not likely to change very much because it's pretty clam damn close to where Wolfgang Schäuble has been arguing. Or the Common Banking Resolution Fund. Guess what they've been able to agree on? Almost exactly what Wolfgang Schäuble has been saying for months. So all the rest of the Eurozone is actually facing very little change in the German position on banking union. Eurobonds forget them. The SPD realized very quickly in the election campaign that Merkel was onto a winner by saying, not in my lifetime. I don't think she absolutely means not in my lifetime, but she certainly means not in, well, Merkel's lifetime. She means a political lifetime of a couple of years or so. <laughs> um, but the SPD did want a, a, debt, res a, 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 a debt redemption fund. Um, and the CDU, CSU have had such a hard line against any form of mutualized, jointly guaranteed debt that the SPD are just going to drop it. They're not prepared to die for it in the trenches. Now, as a key question, nonetheless, about personalities, which is going to affect the European a debate undoubtedly, because the key negotiator is going to be the finance minister, and it's the most important job in the government. And will the SPD demand the finance ministry? And we still don't know. Um, or will Wolfgang Schäuble stay there? Merkel would like Wolfgang Schäuble to stay there. He's been very successful for her. Amazingly, as a finance minister, he's the second most popular man in the government. Um, and he's a very much a known quantity. He's prickly, he's independent, he's always thought he would be a better chancellor than Frau Merkel, but nonetheless, he's loyal at the end of the day. So I suspect that we're still going to have Wolfgang Schäuble as finance minister because the SPD has no obvious candidate for the job. Um, that is, unless Sigmar Gabriel himself, who will be the vice chancellor, actually decides that even if he doesn't really want the job, it's the most powerful job in government mm. short of being chancellor and he has to take it. He's going to leave that, I think, till the very end. We're not going to see personalities come into the picture until the very end. And one of the reasons is tactical for Mr. Gabriel. He's got to go to his party grassroots at the end of the day and sell the programme. And if he comes to them with a programme where actually nobody's paying attention to the details and everybody's paying attention to who's got what job, it's going to look as if the party leadership 
has negotiated the whole deal just so they'll get nice jobs in the cabinet. So what he's going to try and do is keep personalities out of it and put policies to the party that they can say, oh yes, well done, you've got a minimum wage for us, you've got rent controls for us, you've got more spending on schools and kindergarten, so that's all to the good, we'll vote for it. Um, So I think at the very end of the day, uh, it's still wide open. I would say I'm 55% expecting Schäuble to stay, but there's a very strong lobby in the SPD that says, even if we haven't got the obvious candidate, we must get the job. Um, incidentally, Wolfgang Schäuble, if he didn't get the job, and everybody tells me he's very relaxed about it, he's 71 years old, this will be his last job in any German government, he would be perfectly happy to be foreign minister to go to the Foreign Office and be the great European that he really wants to be and not the brute in a wheelchair who tells everybody else that they've got to obey his rules. Um, And he would actually play then a very interesting role, I think, in the longer range uh, European... um, uh, the European reform process, treaty change, perhaps, uh, underpinning a much more integrated Eurozone with democratic accountability, how's that going to be done? He would love to be thinking of of things like this. After all, it was Wolfgang Schäuble who first really espoused the idea of a European monetary fund, which is exactly what we've got with the European stability mechanism. So it's an interesting future. Anyway, um, Wolfgang Schäuble believes that euro bonds, eurozone bonds of some sort, are actually inevitable, but you need treaty change, he insists, to have it. He wouldn't be able to get it past the constitutional court, let alone the German electorate, unless there was clear treaty change that actually said, set, you know, all the rules very firmly enforceable before Germany will guarantee fundamentally other people's debts. Anyway, Gabriel, Sigmar Gabriel also believes in that. So it's very interesting. You've got significant elements in this new government who are actually believers in, if you like, more of a transfer union in the European Union. Um, the, the second thing, energy transition, is a very big deal for German business. And the German business community was amazingly reticent at the beginning of the process Uh, when Merkel suddenly decided overnight to accelerate the exit from nuclear power, re-accelerate back to where it was. Um, And then more and more it's come out that people are actually really nervous about the very high costs, both for industry and for consumers, of the transition. That's the job that's been dumped in the lap of Peter Altmaier, one of the other great Europeans in the German government, Uh, And it's a very difficult balancing act to get because nobody, nobody wants to reverse the nuclear decision. Uh, Somehow they've got to make that transition to renewable energy without bankrupting German industry down the line. The interesting thing about the debate, of course, is that the splits over energy policy are not between the CDU and the SPD, but within the CDU and within the SPD. It's between the lender who have old energy and the lender who want new energy. So it's actually a very difficult balancing act uh, to get right. Um, I've I've touched on federal reform, I think already it was that earlier. Federal reform is about helping the lender to cope with a balanced budget. So it's It's going to see a transfer of money to the lender. This is the one area where I think we might have a little more stimulus than is expected or intended for for growth, where you'd get more spending going into transport, canals, railways, but also schools and higher education and broadband. German broadband is still desperately slow. Somebody said the other day it's slower than it is in Romania, Um, which is not something that you say. Anyway... um, and, and, and federal reform is a good way of buying in the social democrat state premiers like Hannah-Laura Kraft, very important person, the state premier in North Rhine-Westphalia, who could very well be, she will be the more likely candidate for chancellor next time round. If there's no Angela Merkel standing in four years' time, then suddenly it's much more open. Um, and the final issue, managing demographic change, is a big theme for Merkel, and that also helps her, I think, with... Uh, with the Social Democrats and bringing in, um, bringing in uh, more social policies. Um, 
Sigma Gabriel has played a weak hand in these negotiations rather well. He got all his fellow SPD leaders into the negotiations. They're all involved. It's an enormous 75 people are sitting in the main uh, room trying to sort these things out. And the main reason to do that was for Gabriel to get all his people on board so that at the end of the day, he's not sitting as the only one who's selling the idea. Um, uh, So... In a way, to draw things back together, um, don't raise your hopes for any big change in Eurozone strategy. The Merkel balance, being pro-European while protecting the German taxpayer, is exactly what German voters wanted. That's why they gave her so many votes. And as for long-term reform and treaty change... Well, yes, Germany is prepared to go down that route and indeed says it's inevitable. It's France that's hesitating. It's, it's François Hollande who's terrified at the thought of splitting his socialist party with another EU referendum. So Merkel has said, OK, well, we'll do everything we can short of treaty change, but at the end of the day, I think we may have to do it. On the other hand, I don't want such a treaty change that David Cameron is going to drive a coach and horses through the acquis communautaire. I want a very minor treaty change that will allow us to do what we need in the Eurozone. She's worried that she wants Cameron on board, she wants Cameron to stay in, but she doesn't want to open a Pandora's box to everybody to try and pull out the stitches uh, in what's been agreed. And the SPD, very importantly, of course, doesn't like at all the sort of things that Cameron might like to repatriate. Uh, The SPD wants to keep them as European rules. The social regulation and so on is something very important to to, uh, the SPD heart. So Cameron should beware that this grand coalition in Germany is going to be somehow easy for him to get what he wants out of. And I think Ireland should also beware. Because remember one other thing about the SPD. They are strongly opposed, viscerally opposed, to what they call tax dumping. They think this is unfair competition. They think this is, this is undermining uh, both uh, a, a level playing field uh, and they were the hardest line, remember, in the Cyprus program in forcing Cyprus to haircut its bank depositors. They regard low-tax regimes, whether they're in Cyprus or in Ireland, as fundamentally unfair competition. Angela Merkel is more pragmatic. For her, the key is stabilising the euro. Her mantra remains, if the euro fails, Europe will fail. Everything else is a lower priority, including keeping the Brits in the European Union. She will be intergovernmental if she must, but communautaire if she can. She doesn't really trust Barroso. She doesn't think he's been a successful president. So she's a bit anti-commission at the moment. But this is entirely tactical. This is not fundamental to her. She's not unlike the Brits and the French. She is much more communautaire. She's not an intergovernmentalist. Um, The next European Parliament elections are going to be fascinating because guess what? The two partners in the German government will be back on opposite sides of the fence. So another reason for not putting too much detail in their European policy, five months after they form a government, they're going to be fighting against each other on European policies. So they each want to keep a few policies in their back pockets uh, so that they can disagree. But at the end of the day, this next German government is going to be more pro-European than the last one but also not very different in its fundamental difficulty. And my last thought is just to leave the open question of the Alternative für Deutschland. Is this Eurosceptic movement in Germany, and let's be very clear, it's a Eurosceptic movement. It's a movement that is opposed to the Euro being... uh, quite so, I mean, they want to split the euro fundamentally. They'd like the Greeks out, they'd like other Mediterranean countries out if they can't hack it. Uh, They were very careful in the election campaign not to be labelled as a right-wing party, anti-immigration as well as anti-euro, like UKIP in Britain or indeed Gert Wilders in the Netherlands. Um, But they have a potential pool of support of 15 to 20%. If the euro is seen to be damaging to German interests then that support could turn out, certainly in the European elections, to back them. Uh, And, of course, the thing that really worries people in Germany about the Eurozone is not so much the amount of money that may be going to guarantee Ireland or Greece or Portugal or wherever. It's the low interest rates. It's the fact that savers aren't getting any money back uh, on their savings. 
And that's where they're feeling that the euro has not been good for Germany. And even if you turn around and say, oh, my God, but look at the fact that you've had this fantastic export market with a guaranteed exchange rate. No, it's actually still a belief that it hasn't been fundamentally good for Germany. So there's my last open question, that there is always going to be a, a drag on the fundamental pro-Europeanness of Germany. I will stop there.